Okay, I think we have admitted uh, everyone who uh, was waiting to join the meeting. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melanie O'Brien, and I am the designated federal official to the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Review Committee. I'd like to welcome the review committee members, the National NAGPRA program staff, and all of you who are in attendance. For the first time in the history of this committee, I'd also like to welcome you to our first all virtual meeting. While we have webcast meetings and held teleconferences in the past, this is our first foray into an all virtual meeting. Uh, you will notice that all of you um, do not have access to your camera or audio um, during the meeting. Um, we will be turning that feature on as the meeting proceeds. If uh, you do wish to make a comment to the during the public comment period of our agenda. I would also like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and transcripts and minutes will be made publicly available. The minutes and transcripts will include the names of all of those in attendance at today's meeting. If you object to any of these uh, recordings of either the um, content or your name, you may disconnect at this time. This meeting is held under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, and its implementing regulations. FACA requires meetings be held in public at reasonably accessible locations and convenient times, and with adequate advance notice of each meeting published in the Federal Register. This meeting was noticed in the Federal Register on June 2nd, 2021, FACA requires the committee have a valid charter renewable every two years. The current review committee charter was filed on November 27, 2020. FACA further requires that committee membership be fairly balanced um, in terms of the points of view represented and the functions to be performed. To achieve this, the review committee is comprised of seven members. Three members nominated by Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, and traditional Native American religious leaders, with at least two such persons being traditional Indian religious leaders. Three members are nominated by national museum organizations and scientific organizations, and one member is appointed from a list of persons developed and consented to by all the other members. Members are appointed by the Secretary of the Interior and serve as advisors to the Secretary on NAGPRA related issues. The purpose of the review committee is to monitor and review the implementation of the inventory and identification process and repatriation activities under section five, six, and seven of NAGPRA. Under 25 US Code 3006C, the review committee is charged with this purpose to ensure a fair and objective consideration and assessment of all available relevant information and evidence. In addition, the review committee is responsible for reviewing and making findings of fact relating to the identity, cultural affiliation, or the return of cultural items upon the request of an affected party and facilitating the informal resolution of any disputes relating to repatriation of NAGPRA cultural items. The review committee is responsible for recommending specific actions for dispositions of culturally unidentifiable human remains and for consulting with Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, and museums on matters within the scope of the work of this committee. Finally, the review committee is also responsible for reporting to Congress on progress and any barriers encountered in carrying out its responsibilities. With that as an introduction to this meeting, I'd like to start with a roll call of the committee members. Um, please answer out loud as I call your name. You will also need to unmute yourself. John Beaver. Present. Honor Keeler. Here. Barnaby Lewis. Here. Frank McManaman. Present. Timothy McEwen. 
Present. Shelby Tisdale. Present. Armand Menthorn. Mr. Menthorn informed me that he would be unable to attend today's meeting due to a family emergency. The charter for the review committee does not contain a quorum requirement and a meeting may be held with fewer than seven members present. FACA requires that committee membership be fairly balanced in terms of point of views represented and the functions to be performed. As the designated federal official to this committee, I've determined that the meeting may proceed. Therefore, I will go ahead and call this meeting to order. Before we begin with our agenda item for today, I would like to ask if any of the members of the committee would like to provide an invocation or a traditional welcome for our meeting today, or if anyone would like to invite someone from the audience to provide us with a traditional opening. Would anyone like to provide us with a traditional opening? I just want to uh, say that uh, <clears throat> as the traditional religious leader member here, I believe it would be my responsibility but I just want you to know that in our in our way of life, we don't uh, step forward and take these kind of um, obligations. You know, in our in our way, we have to be asked uh, individually. So you need to ask me if I if somebody wants me to offer a prayer. And um, Patrick Lyons, the previous. Uh, Chair, he worked with us in Southern Arizona, so he'd always asked me before the meeting, and so that's how we proceeded with getting that done. Uh, so for now, I guess you could call it a disclaimer, and I'll go ahead and step forward and provide that, because it is very necessary and critical that we ask the Creator for his help. I want to always say, too, that I normally do this in the language that the Creator gave us uh, the autumn language. And I don't want to do it with the video on, I'll do it with the audio. Tanatha Gamatida de Edentash, he joke it on, he give up that he must come with a good good to be joke, Shawnee, that to me, she was like my chick shirt away, swatch. I must my chick, my nanko mom's a girl, which come nanko mom's a go at the me joke, either I joke a dam at the him up, I guess he must my art be that work again. Much of Masma Chewing, Mushoi, be swatch by the hem, which be to Jokoi, sure and eat a corner's chany. Much of Masma Chewing, which swam I to touch your Masma Matoy, but knock a quit boom fit with a boom which come hooky here, him come a good hum which come. Which has to be ag, e I go either, but get a hide and who come, what Masma Chew to Mushur it with watch, is chipped or sure it is what you must make me to knuckle. Quajuko Sabanuko, but I'm dead more anodic, with Piju Homuch could moon milk, the key am dead data, but I'm dead more for me a wafa, open my oaker, come dead more knuckle quajuko, open soft with it, he keeps Matava Pirimusha or Kodate, quiet figure, which me touch him with worthy tear, with my humper, with my joko is up, he danced good eve that, and must my mother bite ye gurka, bite his happy bush away. Hasiuri da maswama si ai to bab gatem that Higmas ma yemat wuzi joy juku is chipped the hugger in moyamag eve that 
Madame de Moit Nakoko is a Juko sap, I at the year, sap at the worm in June, and Massa Matat Nakoko is you, Madame Shuring him cheer the Chani, Major Kaiji, the Bursa is the Machitacho Coyota at Argent, a Burger, Bursa is the Matmoita, who come a virgin, supper. That concludes the traditional prayer for this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barnaby. And thank you as well for that education on uh, the, the, the proper procedures. We appreciate that. Uh, before we begin our first agenda item, I would like to acknowledge the people that have assisted me in this meeting today. Uh, we have three, uh, we have two attorneys here with us from the Department of the Interior Office of the Solicitor. Brady Blasco is with the Division of Parks and Wildlife and Stephen Simpson is with the Division of Indian Affairs. For the National NAGPRA program, Lisa Koshelski is the review committee coordinator responsible for organizing this meeting and preparing the minutes and transcripts of these proceedings. Other members of the National NAGPRA program staff are also in attendance today. I greatly appreciate the support of the program staff, as well as others within the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior who have assisted us um, in preparing for this meeting. While we have all become more adept at holding virtual meetings over the last year and a half, uh, this is still a first for the review committee and it took some behind the scenes effort to make this happen. And finally, a big thank you to those of you who are joining us today. Please note that the review committee is very interested in receiving comments on progress made and barriers encountered in implementing NAGPRA. If you're interested in providing public comment during this meeting or any of the future meetings of the review committee, please let me know when I ask for public comment. At the time for public comment, I'll turn on the chat feature for this meeting, or you can use the raise your hand function to request time for public comment. You can also email me to make your request at nagpra underscore info at nps.gov. If you are unable to provide public comment in this meeting, there are future opportunities to provide public comment. Feel free to contact me directly at that email address or by phone uh, anytime to assist you with making um, arrangements for public comment. Moving on to our agenda for today. The first item on the agenda is the selection of a chair. The selection of a chair for this committee is required by the act as well as the committee charter. Under the current meeting procedures, the chair serves a two year term with no limits on the number of terms. If the chair is absent or needs to be recused from consideration of a matter, the chair may appoint another member to serve in his or her place, and the DFO may also serve as chair if needed. At this time, I'd like to turn the discussion um, concerning the selection of a chair over to you, the review committee. When you're speaking, please be sure you identify yourself before you speak for those who are calling in on the phone line and don't have the benefit of video. Tim. Um, we had a subcommittee meeting of the whole last week, and I know that there were two members that expressed interest in serving as chair. And that one of those is unable to attend at the last minute, and I'm a little reluctant to vote on a potential permanent chair um, when one of the candidates is not here to defend themselves. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion that our committee elect an interim chair to serve from today until such time as all seven members of the committee are in attendance and the new permanent chair can be elected. Thank you, Tim. 
Uh, this is honor. Um, that seems fair. Um, I'd like to second that motion. Thank you, honor. John. Um, with, uh, with the interim chair, would they serve in, or when would be the next opportunity to uh, select the, the permanent chair? Would that be at the next, would that potentially be at the next meeting? Yes, we could, uh, we could follow through um, on July 7th. Uh, so if there's a uh, so if we follow through just a just a little over a week later, would there be the need to to elect a, a chair right now if it's just going to if we're just going to push it back by by one week? Um, that's a good question. I think um, certainly uh, a chair can help facilitate the meeting um, today's meeting, uh, but um, I would be happy to facilitate today's meeting as well. So either process would be fine. Um, to select an interim chair, um, or I can fill that role for today. I think we have a motion, uh, Madam uh, DFO. I think we have a motion on the floor. Let's deal with that one, and then if that fails, we can come up with something else. Any other discussion? Could we uh, make a slight amendment to the motion on the floor that uh, we do as John suggested and uh, Melanie agreed to facilitate this meeting and then we postpone the election until uh, the meeting next week. But I would offer that as an as just as an amendment to the motion on the floor if, if that's proper procedure. Proceed. This is. Um, I'm not a parliamentarian, but I think we would need to dispense with this motion and then introduce yours. I don't know if it's an amendment. It's sort of counter to, but that's fine. We can we can do that. So can we ask the uh, the DFO to maybe summarize her understanding of what motion is on the floor with the uh, the amendment, the amended text or amended version or whatever. Yes. Um, I would say the um, amended motion um, is uh, to to select an interim chair who uh, will be the DFO for this meeting. Um, and uh, move forward with the selection of a chair at the next meeting on July 7th. Any other discussion? Okay, so again, the, the motion is for um, the DFO to serve as the interim chair for the purposes of this meeting um, and for the committee to select a chair at the next meeting on July 7th. Um, Melanie, just a question about procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like these are two separate motions um that are being presented it sounds like the first one is to elect an interim chair um at this moment uh and then have the chair elected in the next meeting uh, that we have and that there's a separate um and i'm just looking at it procedurally there's this kind of a separate motion um that may take place after that for um, you to be interim chair, if then that fails. Um, well, I think it we could uh, we could mix this up in 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 many different ways. Um, 
Uh, we don't necessarily have to have it be a separate two separate motions, um, but if that's how you'd like to proceed, um, we can certainly do so. I think I'd prefer that just to make it clear. Procedurally. OK, so the first motion then would be to elect an interim chair. Um, that was proposed by Tim and seconded by Honor. Is there further discussion of that original motion? Tim, your hand is still up. I'm not sure if that's OK. <laughs> Uh, okay, then I'll go ahead and, and call a, a, a voice vote. I'll I'll um, call your name and you can say um, yes or no, yay or nay, whatever you prefer, as long as we um, hear your response audibly, please. Uh, again, the motion is... Can I, can I read the motion just so that everybody's clear what we're voting on? Yes. Uh -huh. um, I move that our committee elect an interim chair to serve from today until such time as seven members of the committee are in attendance and a new permanent chair can be elected. Thank you. Shall we proceed to a vote? OK. Uh, Tim. Hi. Thank you. Honor. Hi. Barnaby. No. John. No. Shelby. No. Frank. Hi. There's nothing like starting easy. This is this is good. We have a, a vote of, of three yes and, and three no. Um, on uh, electing an interim chair. My understanding of the procedure is in the in the case of a tie, the motion fails. Honor, is that standard procedure? I think we may have to ask our uh, our attorneys there. <laughs> Um, I, I actually don't think this is necessarily a, a question for the attorneys. This is more a, a procedure, and um, I would say that. At this point, um, we need to to reconsider, uh, given the three to three split. Um, we need to go back to the beginning and we need to discuss how this committee will be chaired um, for this meeting at the very least um, or um, future meetings. Um, the options are um, for one member to be selected as an interim chair for the purposes of this meeting, or as uh, the motion was originally stated, um, for meetings until there are uh, seven members present. Um, the other option would be uh, for me to serve as the chair for the purposes of this meeting, and then we could revisit this question on July 7th. Are there other options people would like to propose in moving forward? I have a question regarding the first motion. Um, I, I don't know if this is kind of a procedural thing as well. If we voted 
yes on that first motion would that only limit the temporary or uh, I guess temporary chair to just one week or um, or would it also um, would we also be able to include the DFO in that vote as well as a possible um, chair to go ahead for one week? So I, I um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how quite to answer. There were two questions there. The, the first is the motion was actually um, to elect an interim chair until all seven members were present. Um, and while we would hope that that would be um, on July 7th, it, it, it may not be in the way the motion was structured, that, that would not be the case. Um, whether or not the DFO could serve as that interim chair, um, if, if you were to agree to select an interim chair, I, the DFO can always serve as the chair um, if, if that is necessary. Um, this is Jim. I actually don't think we can elect the DFO as the chair. Okay. We That's, can only elect a member. Okay. And the appoint that, and the the role of the DFO serving as chair is at the direction of the secretary. And that's statutory and regulatory. So it comes from different sources. And I'm not peddling law here without a license. Um, I'll ask Stephen and Brady if that's not correct. Well, I, I think at this point, um, the responsibility of the committee is to select a chair. Um, uh, for um, the extent of, of our of our guidance here is on selecting a chair. Um, we have in the past used an interim chair as a means of um, of delaying a decision for another time. Um, and in the past, uh, the DFO has served as chair of the committee um, when it is in the best interest of the committee um, and its work. John, did you have your hand raised? Uh, no, I did not. Sorry, this is Honor. Is there a statutory authority? Um, I, I kind of heard something about the Secretary of the Interior having to um, okay uh, the DFO for chairing. Uh, could someone, maybe the attorneys or someone on the line with our committee? Um, just talk about that. I think Tim, you you would mention that. I can jump in here. Um, direction or approval of the Secretary of the Interior is not necessary for Melanie to act as DFO for this meeting. If that is what the committee uh, needs to move forward for the particular meeting itself, Tim, you are correct that the committee cannot elect. Uh, the DFO to be the the chairperson. Um, a, a, a vote for a chairperson should be for a member of the review committee. Um, however, in such a case where there's like this is a good example where there might be a single meeting uh, and it would be um, more efficient or prudent for the committee to address the chair discussion uh, when all seven are present at the next meeting, uh, the DFO can fulfill this as more of an administrative duty in the absence of an elected chair. Okay. Thank you, Brady. Should we um, should we make them? This isn't a motion, but should we make a motion to that effect, and then vote on that that the 
DFO serve for this meeting as uh, to administer the meeting as the chair. And the plan is that at the next meeting, when we hope all, all seven members will be present, we will proceed with the, the actual election of a chair. If that sounds like it would be a suitable motion, I will make it, but um, so um, let me make that as a motion, then we can have a discussion. Where second? We have to second to first. Frank, if I if I might suggest one thing, again, I don't think we can elect the DFO as the chair, but we can decline to elect the chair. That would be an appropriate motion. Well, I wasn't suggesting wasn't suggesting we use the word chair. Rather, we ask the DFO to administer the meeting so that we can proceed with the other other um, topics on the agenda. So the DFO wouldn't be voting as the, as a chair or, or things of that sort. And uh, if I mean, if we can do that administratively, it seems like that might be the simplest thing. And we should really get off this and, and on to uh, some of the business that we've got to do. So again, I'll make that as a motion, but it needs a second. This is Barnaby, I second. Is, is there discussion? Just to restate the motion clearly. That we um, ask the DFO to administratively oversee the uh, running of this particular meeting uh, in the absence of a chair. And uh, we plan at the next meeting for the election of the chair to be the first item on the agenda or on the agenda. Any discussion? Okay, um, would you like to proceed to a vote? All right, I will call the names and respond um, by voice. Frank? Yes. Barnaby? Yes. John? Yes. Honor. Um, hi, could you restate the motion again? If my um, internet here is a little bubbly. I have it written if you would like me to say it. Yes, please. Frank made a motion to ask the DFO to administratively oversee the running of this particular meeting in the absence of a chair and plan at the next meeting for the election of the chair to be the first item on the agenda or on the agenda. Uh, no. Okay, uh, honor your response is no. Okay. Shelby? Yes. Tim? Yes. Okay. The motion carries. Um, I will administer this meeting and uh, we will make the selection of a chair the first item on the agenda um, on July 7th.
thank you, everyone. Um, the next item on the agenda is a discussion of the meeting procedures for the review committee. Um, in addition to the act, as well as uh, the Federal Advisory Committee Act and NAGPRA um, and the committee's charter, the meeting procedures give guidance to the committee on how to carry out its responsibilities. The current procedures were developed by the review committee and reviewed by the designated federal official. The meeting procedures were adopted by the chair of the committee and the DFO in October 2018. Item 11 of the procedures require that meeting procedures be reviewed by the review committee every two years or with the selection of a new chair, whichever might occur first. So given that uh, we are past the two year time frame, um, it is this is an opportunity for the committee to discuss the procedures as currently um, written and adopted and uh, suggest any changes um, that the committee might see um, are needed in the current meeting procedures. Tim. Um, after our meeting of the whole last week, uh, I took the opportunity to review the, the procedures and compare them with the regulatory requirements for FACA, as well as consider some of the issues that have happened over the last year uh, where we had no meeting uh, and I provided to the committee some recommendations on changes of language. Um, so in order to sort of proceed with that and to sort of get to the discussion part, um, I'd like to move that the committee adopt the proposed amendments to the committee meeting procedures uh, effective today. Um, okay, so so Tim, you're moving to accept uh, the changes um, as you've proposed them. Correct, and that sort of gets us to the point where we can open discussion on it. We need to have a motion on the floor in order to discuss it. Uh, there, there are some other options. Um, I, I will say that the meeting procedures um, were initially drafted. Um, by a subcommittee that that is another option um, for how the committee might want to proceed. Um, but the motion before you is to uh, accept the changes uh, as um, Tim has proposed them in his draft. I, I should say for the um, public sake uh, that you can find, I, I forgot to add this, you can find a copy of the meeting procedures as currently adopted on the NAGPRA website. That's nps.gov slash NAGPRA and it's under review committee. Um, we will also be making a copy of the proposed uh, changes that Tim has um, distributed publicly available. We we did not do that before the meeting, however. Um, hi, this is Honor. I'll second that motion if it leads to a discussion. OK, so Honor is seconding um, that motion to accept the changes. Brady. Uh, thank you. I want to clarify a bit of the process for um, establishing these meeting procedures, and I apologize, a large truck just drove by me. Um, uh, the committee at this time can can vote on pre presenting a draft of procedures to the DFO, who can review them on behalf of the secretary, but the procedures themselves and the rules pertaining to the committee um, are uh, under authority of the secretary meant to be determined by the secretary themselves. Now, the secretary is very, very deferential to the needs of the committee and is very interested in recommendations from the committee. It's why we've had subcommittees in the past. 
Um, so I, I just want to be sure that we're, we're clear on what the what what we can vote on today within in the meeting, and that would essentially be to uh, uh, present these for review by by the by the Department of the Interior, uh, who can then consult with the chair and uh, eventually. And I believe you'll see this in the current draft right now. Both the DFO and the chair sign off on the meeting procedures when they're finalized. Thank you, Brady. Is there a discussion? Uh, Madam DFO? Yes. Um, if I might. Um, I can review the changes. I know that the public doesn't have a copy of this, but um, in looking through the, if that's okay with you. Um, I guess I'd like a, a sense of um, uh, from the other committee members, um, if, if they would like to go through the changes as proposed. Um, hi, this is Honor. I think it's worthwhile for the public to hear any proposed changes. Any other comments? Uh, this is Frank. I uh, had a chance to look through the the, the changes. They're a little, little hard for me to tell uh, the extent to which they're substantive and the extent to which they're just an administrative change or a reference to a particular section of 41 CFR um, that relates to the FACA uh, process. But it did, and Tim clearly put a lot of thought into it, so I appreciate that. Um, I think it, I, I think it will require more than a discussion that we can have at this, this particular meeting to uh, just accept them as as drafted. Um, so I think I heard Brady say that in the past, the way that this has proceeded is with the subcommittee of the of the uh, of the review committee, actually spending some time uh, looking at uh, different drafts or what needs to be done or why changes would benefit the the process and the and the uh, the committee's function. And um, it might be that we want to proceed that way, but that that's just offered. I just offer that as a a matter of discussion, uh, part of the part of the discussion. So, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to make that comment. Um, Frank, um, I'm willing to withdraw my motion if um, if we can agree that we need to establish a subcommittee to work on this with the idea of coming up with a revised set of procedures in the next week or so. This is Barnaby. Sounds that's probably the best way to go. Withdraw and then uh, have a subcommittee review and submit a draft proposal or changes. Um, but before I withdraw, can we get some agreement that we need to do this expeditiously? Yes. Yes, yeah, so I would I would agree with that. Yes, I, I would agree with it as well. Um, with that, I will withdraw my motion. Okay. Is there any other discussion of the meeting procedures at this time? What what I would like to suggest is that um, the, the committee um, bring up a subcommittee discussion um, at that part of the agenda um, in formulating the subcommittee and its members. And uh, to Tim's point about expeditious, I would also suggest the committee consider um, tasking that subcommittee with some clear time frames.
Is there other discussion about the meeting procedures? Or questions? Um, hi, Melanie. I'm just making sure that's available on the public website at this point. The, the current version is, yes, it's um, on under the review committee. Thank you for confirming that. Um, and can you post the proposal as well? Yes, we will add um, Tim's proposed uh, revisions to the meeting materials for this meeting. Thank you. That's very awesome. And just this is Frank again. So my understanding is we will uh, discuss a subcommittee and a time frame and uh, a charge to the subcommittee when we talk about subcommittees later in this meeting. That is correct. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Um, we will move on in the agenda. Um, I'm wondering uh, how the committee feels about scheduling breaks. Um, I know that it can be difficult to um, Stay on camera and um, sitting still for for too long. We we got started a little late. It's just now about 50 minutes since we started. Um, the next item on the agenda is a report from the program, which will um, not be too lengthy. Um, would the committee like to take a break now or or proceed and then take a break uh, at a later time? Madam Chair, now that you're controlling this meeting, how many breaks are you planning to give us? I was thinking about once an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we should take one now, I think. Ms. Barnaby, I agree. I do too. <laughs> okay. Um, for uh, for everyone's health and safety, then we will take a, a, a five minute, just a five minute stretch break. Feel free to turn off your cameras um, and uh, and we'll come back um, at the top of the hour. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We will go ahead and, and resume our agenda. The third item on the agenda for today is a report from the National NAGPRA program. Um, to begin my report, um, on behalf of the National NAGPRA program, I'd like to describe the responsibilities delegated to the program by the Secretary of the Interior. The program manager is charged with publishing notices in the Federal Register, administering grants to assist tribes and museums with NAGPRA obligations, receiving and recording inventories and summaries of NAGPRA cultural items, and providing advice and assistance to NAGPRA constituents. As the manager of the National NAGPRA program, I also serve as the designated federal official for the NAGPRA Review Committee. The program continues to meet these responsibilities in large part due to our dedicated staff. Our small but mighty team has carried out these responsibilities to the best of their ability. And over the last year, the staff have adapted our business process to meet the new challenges of remote telework. Lori Jennings in the National NAGPRA program has kept pace with processing incoming notices despite an increase in the number of submissions. Thanks to Lori, as well as to the staff at the Federal Register, we've experienced no delays in publication due to the pandemic. In fiscal year 2021, we've published 102 notices so far. Sarah Glass, the Notice and Grants Coordinator, has been dedicated to successful grants management and outreach over the last year. For fiscal year 2020, NAGPRA grants were increased by Congress from 1.65 million to 1.9 million, and that amount was again appropriated for fiscal year 2021. We are still in the middle of our current grant cycle, and we hope to be able to announce this year's grant awards in the next couple of months. The program continues to work closely with museums and federal agencies to update or amend their inventories and summaries and to ensure that our database is accurate. I'd like to recognize Mariah Soriano for her remarkable work in continuing to keep our database updated with regular submissions from museums and federal agencies. And we continue to provide regular advice and assistance to anyone who requests it through phone calls or emails uh, for those of you listening, you can always reach us at nagpra underscore info at nps.gov. I'd especially like to recognize David Tarler for his work in um, assisting uh, many, many people who have called us or emailed us with direct technical assistance on NAGPRA issues. Since February, we have been able to secure additional assistance from David Barlin Lyles the lead ranger at Effigy Mounds National Monument. Dave has helped us in responding to an increasing number of requests for assistance from individuals of the public, as well as concerned citizens. And Dave, as a law enforcement, uh, uh, as a law enforcement expert, has been uh, especially helpful in referring issues to the proper authorities for either criminal enforcement or civil action as necessary. Dave has been assisting the program for many years on an ad hoc basis, and we've been very pleased to have more of his dedicated time over the last few months. And finally, I'd like to write, recognize Lisa Koshelski, our review committee coordinator, whose assistance has been welcome over the past few months as we've worked to organize this meeting. In October 2020, the entire staff was able to attend and participate in the sixth annual repatriation conference hosted by the Association of American Indian Affairs and the University of Denver. The conference was a, a huge success despite its transition to a virtual platform um, with the largest attendance of any repatriation conference and um, as well as the ability to reach many, many people through the recordings of that event. Once again, I'd really like to commend the staff of the National NAGPRA program for their collective efforts which has allowed the program to continue its responsibilities even in uh, the past year. 
You can find more details about our work in our annual program reports, which are available on the NAGPRA website, nps.gov slash NAGPRA under law and policy. And as you all know, one of my explicit responsibilities as the manager of the National NAGPRA program is to serve as the designated federal official and provide administrative support to you, the NAGPRA Review Committee. The last meeting of the NAGPRA Review Committee was held on October 30th, 2019 by telephone. No additional public meetings have occurred since that time. As you know, this is the first of a series of meetings that we scheduled for this summer. Prior to this public meeting, the review committee has convened several subcommittee meetings to prepare for this meeting and to receive its annual ethics training as required by the Department of the Interior. Two members of the committee have been appointed since the last meeting in 2019. Tim McEwen and Shelby Tisdale were appointed just over a year ago in June of 2020. NPS is currently soliciting nominations for one vacancy on the committee for a traditional Indian religious leader from nominations by Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, and traditional Native American religious leaders. Nominations are due on August 9th, 2021. A link to the Federal Register notice is available on our website. Again, nps.gov slash NAGPRA and under news at the bottom. Following this meeting, we are already beginning planning uh, following this series of meetings this summer, we are already beginning planning for our next meeting in the fall. Uh, we hope that the review committee will be able to um, gather in person in October 2021. We're still working on the details of that proposal. The review committee did recently receive an invitation from the Miami tribe of Oklahoma to meet in its traditional homelands at Indiana University. That's uh, the sum of my brief report to you. There are additional details provided um, in our program reports, and I would be happy to answer any questions the committee has about the work of the NAGPRA program. Um, before I take your questions, I'll just note that um, uh, we did post the, uh, the uh, Tim's suggested revisions to the meeting procedures are in the meeting materials. The other benefit of a virtual meeting, I was able to send them to Mariah and she just posted them to the website so the public can find them there. So are there questions about the work of the National NAGPRA program? Hi, Melanie, this is Honor. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about Mr. Lyle's position and his FTE. Sure, um, so uh, right now we have an arrangement um, for um, a portion of Dave's time um, and uh, to assist in, in incoming requests and, and other matters that we have in the NAGPRA program. Um, we hope that we will be able to advertise and hire a full-time employee um, in a civil penalty investigator position, um, but that is still going through the HR process. All right, and just to follow up on that, um, how long has uh, he served in that position and uh, have we ever had a full-time investigator um, for civil penalties? Um, th thank you. Um, we have uh, the, the NACPA program for, uh, for a long time, uh, actually since about 2004, has had a, um, a part-time um, ad hoc relationship with um, several investigators um, and law enforcement agents within the National Park Service. Um, both the, uh, the lead ranger at Effigy Mounds, the position that Dave currently holds, his predecessor in that position, um, assisted the program with civil penalty investigations. Um, he, he is the face of, of the training videos that we have on our YouTube channel for civil enforcement, Bob Palmer, um, as well as other resources within the National Park Service for um, investigations. Um, uh, Dave has been serving in that role, again, in an, in an ad hoc position um, for some time. 
Um, we have also had other law enforcement agents who have assisted us with civil penalty investigations in the past. We have never had a full-time civil penalty investigator. Tim? Um, as I, I think you know, Melanie, I am a big consumer of NAGPRA information. Um, and in sort of preparing for this, I took a look at uh, the program reports for the last number of years. Uh, and I've noted that for the past four years, there's been a reduction in the amount of information that's provided regarding program facets. The 2017-2018 reports diminished the amount of information, particularly regarding civil penalties and the budget. And the 2019-2020 reports were actually not published until January of this year. Uh, I did note that uh, all four of these reports seem to claim a copyright protection, which I don't think extends to the federal government. And the 2019 and 2020 reports appear to be backdated, erroneously backdated. So with that in mind, I'd like to make a proposal or move that for the 2021 report going forward, uh, that our, our committee requests that the National Park Service at a minimum return to the amount of information and data that's included in the FY 2016 program report and that the draft of that 2021 program report be provided to the committee members, say by December 1 of 2021, which gives you two months to prepare it. Thank you for that input. I will note that the committee has requested um, updated budget information from the National NAGPRA program, or I should say a subcommittee um, to, of the review committee made that request and those budgets were prepared and, and I, I will be um, updating the public uh, annual program reports to include that budget information. I think my point is that I think we need to have this timely because those program reports are really the window for both this review committee and the public into what you are doing. Uh, and I think that they're critical. I understand the last four years have been troubling for many at many different levels, but I did notice that this reduction of information started with the 2017 report. So I think we should sort of get back to normal. Thank you. Um, I would uh, take the opportunity to solicit input from other members of the committee about, uh, about the work of the program or questions you might have. Uh, this is Frank. I, I wonder, Tim, if you could maybe be a little give us a little more detail of what was left out um, that, that in your review sort of information that was in let's just say the 2016 report but not 17 or going forward. Sorry if you hear a barking dog in the back. Um, <clears throat> the, two, the two things, I, I don't have the detailed analysis before me, but the two things that sort of jumped out was Typically, those reports have always included the expenditures for the program, what they spend their money on, which were dropped. And there was always a listing of how many pending civil penalties there were, how many they had processed, sort of much richer data on what the status was. So I think we need to sort of return to that. Thanks for that detail.
Uh, Tim, were you also um, suggesting uh, just kind of deadlines on things that sounded like um, uh, you were kind of suggesting that we just keep more to a schedule so that information is getting out in a timely manner um, to the public and for, for our meetings? Yeah, I think clearly there were two years where there was no program report published at all. Um, so I think it needs to be done timely. And within a some period of time after, a short period of time, after the close of the fiscal year, uh, I would sort of recommend November or December as that date, uh, given that the program report is really a compilation of data that's already electronically available. It's just sort of putting it into a proper format. Um, and I do think that in terms of the review committee being able to fulfill its obligation to do a report to Congress annually, that information is critical to us. So we need to have it in a timely way so that we can then move ahead with the report to Congress. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think it's vital that we get our um, reports, our annual reports out in a timely manner. And I think just thinking about um, when the fiscal year begins and ends and the information that Congress will need um, from us uh, to coincide uh, with their decision making processes um, and budget um, is important. So I think your suggestion about the date is good. Um, as far as information goes uh, that you had pointed out, I think it's important to get, you know, that information out to um, the public and um, whatever we can do to be transparent in that way, um, but also keep um, folks informed is important to me. And the 2016 report seemed like a much more robust and richer document in terms of the data that was provided. And it was only after that that sting, things started being withdrawn. So I understand that um, there's a lot of information in the current ones, including the graphs and charts and things like that, that are just excellent ways to convey information. But I don't think we should rely on that in lieu of the more detailed information that people rely upon in order to understand what the program is doing. Yeah, I agree that detailed information um, is important. Um, I've, I've kind of enjoyed the graphs <laughs> to see them. Um, I think they're great for presentations. So maybe we can we can have that those graphs, but also have that um, detailed information included in the reports uh, as well. I'm certainly not recommending removing the, the nice charts. They're very useful. Are there other um, questions from the committee about the work of the program? This is Barnaby, I have no questions. I'm sorry, just one last question there. Is is this a motion, Tim, or um, if it is, no? Okay, it's just a suggestion. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to make it a motion if that would help move things along. I think at, at this point, the, the program will uh, take your, um, your recommendations and, and the discussion from the committee um, and consider it in its, its next program report. We appreciate um, your input and and um, your identification of, of information um, that is of use to the committee. Um, so thank you. Okay, we can uh, move on to the next agenda item if there are no other questions. Our next agenda item 
it is time for the review committee to review its current subcommittees. Under FACA, the review committee can use subcommittees to seek information and develop recommendations for the full review committee's discussion and consideration. Subcommittees can include non-members and can have non-public meetings but cannot make recommendations directly to the Department of the Interior, only to the full committee. The review committee has time on the agenda uh, to discuss the status of these subcommittees and their membership, to propose any new subcommittees, and to report um, back to the full committee of any progress or recommendations from the, sub the current subcommittees. Um, before we start the discussion, I'd like to provide a brief summary of the review committee's four standing subcommittees as of uh, the October 2019 meeting. The first subcommittee is um, on the review committee's report to Congress. Its current members are John Beaver, Honor Keeler, and Barnaby Lewis. The second subcommittee is on split collections, and its members are Honor Keeler and John Beaver. Um, the third subcommittee is on the administration of NAGPRA with the members Honor Keeler and Barnaby Lewis. The fourth and final subcommittee is a subcommittee of the whole, which can communicate um, to discuss outstanding issues or administrative tasks, um, but any discussion by the subcommittee of the whole must take place in the full committee in a full public meeting. Um, with that, I'd like to turn the discussion um, back over to the review committee um, for first to discuss any um, additional subcommittees um, or to make changes to the current membership of the existing subcommittees. And then uh, if the committee would like, we can go through a discussion of, of each of the subcommittees. Tim. I think the one we spoke of uh, moments ago was a subcommittee to focus on the meeting procedures. Uh, and I would propose that that subcommittee will likely be of relatively short duration just to get this document completed in a expedited uh, term. Um, and I'll volunteer. but not by myself. <laughs> okay, so Tim has proposed a subcommittee um, for the meeting procedures and has volunteered to serve on that subcommittee. Is there anyone else who would like to participate. Hi, this is Frank. Yes, I'd be interested in that. And do we, is this something that you need a motion for or can we just discuss it? Um, we can discuss it. Um, I will um, confirm um, the makeup of the committee and and um, I will, we will, Lisa, do we need a direct vote on the subcommittee? I think following the discussion, if you state the name of, of the subcommittees and their current membership, um, that there is agreement that these will be formed and that those will be the members through this discussion. That's how we've done it in the past. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll I'll help Tim out on this one. So he's not doesn't get lonely. Anybody else? like to to volunteer i'm happy to be on another subcommittee <laughs> okay so and if i could uh, offer one piece on this um appointing people to particular subcommittees i view that as an opportunity to basically assign who is responsible for getting the work done 
but I think we've run into a problem with the usage of that appointment to be used to exclude other committee members from offering their perspective on things. And in particular, uh, Shelby and I were appointed a year ago and the opinion that we got back is that we couldn't participate in subcommittee activities because we'd not been appointed. And on the meeting procedures in particular, I tried to put in language that makes sure that is not the interpretation. That if anybody wants to participate in dealing with meeting procedures, come on. But that the appointed people are the ones who are responsible for getting the job done not excluding anyone else that's a committee member. Thank you. Um, I, I will state that while subcommittees are not subject to the um, public meeting provisions of FACA, um, there is a requirement that the membership of those subcommittees be formed in a public meeting um, like this, uh, which is why it's important for the purposes of transparency under FACA um, that the membership of these subcommittees be set by the committee of, as a whole, and that that information is recorded in the public transcripts so that any member of the public knows who is a member of those subcommittees. So I would um, encourage anyone who wants to participate in this subcommittee um, to add your name to this list so that it's publicly known who is participating in, in this subcommittee work. Uh, this is Frank, just to for clarification. Um, but if a, a member doesn't particularly want to be on a particular subcommittee, but has some opinions or suggestions for the subcommittee, what I hear Tim saying, I think, is nothing should prohibit the, that, that member who's not formally identified as a member of the subcommittee from providing that information to the, to the members of the subcommittee. They can, I suppose they can do with it what they will will do with it but there's no well i'm asking i guess i'm asking uh it there shouldn't it seems to me be a uh, um, pro prohibition on uh, a committee member weighing in on on a topic even though he or she's not formally on the subcommittee that's dealing with it for example the annual report um committee or even even some of the you know the others the split collections or, or administration that there should be the opportunity to weigh in if, you know, if they've got, if the committee members have a point of view that they want to, the other committee members to know about, the ones who are actually on the subcommittee. Well, I think it comes down to the format of that weighing in, Frank. And, uh, and um, I, I think there is some concern in um, in terms of uh, appearance, um, if uh, a member who is not um, not agreed to serve on a subcommittee during a public meeting such as this, uh, attended and participated in developing recommendations from that subcommittee, uh, that would seem to be avoiding some of uh, the requirements of FACA or trying to get around the public. Um, provisions. Um, I think the place for that input from a member um, is in a public meeting um, uh, or um, in uh, perhaps in a subcommittee of the whole um, if there was information that a, that a member wanted to share with the entire committee. I think what we need to be careful of is, is the appearance of, of anything occurring um, to uh, create a recommendation from a subcommittee um, where the full committee is not aware of, of how those recommendations were developed or, or what their sources were. 
that would be the the main concern. Um, certainly in a public meeting like this, and, and this is the time, uh, certainly uh, right now we have time for subcommittee discussions for any member to provide input on the report to Congress or on other issues, um, including suggestions for how the subcommittee might undertake their work. I'll just add um, one other issue that this raises for the meeting procedure subcommittee um, is some more information on how subcommittees will um, conduct their work. Um, I think that we have seen mm. um, challenges there and some more guidance in the meeting procedures on um, subcommittees um, would be useful. So, um it's it's a matter of degree, as I understand what you're what you're saying, uh, Melanie. The um, if the, if a if a member has some uh, a point of view or some information or something that he or she wants the subcommittee to consider or take it take account of, um, he or she might send an email to the members and say, oh, by the way, here's something that just occurred to me. I, you know, didn't occur in the meeting, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. And I think it's something you might want to look at uh, as you're doing what that subcommittee does. Um, something like that, as I understand what I just, as I understand what you just said, would be a, sort of an appropriate level of, an, of involvement. On the other hand, if the subcommittee was holding meetings, uh, whether they were FACA um, approved or just, you know, a, a subcommittee meeting, uh, uh, the that the individual, indivi other individuals probably wouldn't participate in a, a series of meetings because he or she wasn't a, a member of the of the subcommittee. Um, and then I I know we do have uh, discussions at these full meetings of uh, issues like. The report to Congress and what's in it, and that uh, those of us who haven't been on that committee in the past have felt free, at least I have, to weigh in on uh, particular texts or topics or how topics are presented or things things of that sort. And that, again, is you know the the uh, the appropriate way for uh, for committee review committee members who are not part of a particular subcommittee, perhaps to uh, weigh in at that at that level as well. Is that that's yes, yeah, a reasonable I, interpretation of what she said? I, the, my only addition to that would be if if a committee member wanted to send information to a subcommittee, I would recommend it be sent to the entire committee. Again, just for purposes of transparency, so that it's clear where information is coming from. Um, so I um I would encourage all of you. Um, to, to remember that the goal of the Federal Advisory Committee Act is to ensure that the advice the, the government receives from you, from the, the review committee, um, is done in a public, um, transparent manner um, so that there's no question about how, that how those recommendations are formed, that those recommendations are formed in public, um, in uh, meetings that are um, recorded and transcribed, uh, where minutes are taken, so that it's clear how these recommendations are formulated and move forward to the committee. I mean, I'm sorry, move forward uh, to the agency. Thanks. That's that's a good clarification. Honor. Hi. Yeah. So this um, did occur with uh, at least one of the subcommittee meetings. Um, when we had asked uh, one of our review committee members to uh, attend the meeting. I think some of this can be dealt uh, with in the procedures, but we've also got this um, phenomenon of the review committee not meeting for quite a long time. And so what happened in that interim is that uh, people moved off the committee and on to the review committee and therefore, um, it kind of depleted um, the subcommittees. And so I think this is getting down to a really fundamental um, issue of having our review committee, um, as required by law, uh, to meet 
um, especially on an annual basis and hopefully more often. Um, so to me, this discussion about the subcommittees, um, and I like some of the recommendations that were put forward in the procedures and what Tim was suggesting, because I think it's important to be inclusive and not exclusive. I think we're really getting down to this fundamental question of why um, the review committee has not met and that we are required to meet by law. So, um, you know, we can, we can talk about this um, uh, here and now or in the future, but um, that's what I've seen that has gone on with the subcommittees. And um, in a way, if you don't have the review committee meeting and people are moving off um, because of rotation in the committee, um, they can't get on to the subcommittees. And um, I want to ensure that we are meeting regularly and that the people who wish to be part of these subcommittees are part of it um, and that we're fulfilling our statutory um, and legal duties. Thank you. And I think one issue that comes up, the, the person on or asked me to participate in one of the subcommittee meetings and I received a message back that imply that there might be some potential conflict there, which seems crazy to me. We are not outside parties. There are only seven of us, and we are all appointees of the Secretary of the Interior. So if anybody could be able to work on any of these committees, we should be able to. And we shouldn't use some administrative piece about, well, you weren't appointed in a public meeting, to preclude that input because the secretary put his or her faith, his I guess for all of us, his faith in us to do this job and to use some administrative piece to say, well, but not you two, seems crazy. So I think we need to have a mechanism to get around that perhaps, um, and with Frank's concurrence and Honor's concurrence, um, I, perhaps the three of us as being, if this committee goes ahead, need to have a meeting with one of the general law solicitors that deals with FACA to find out what the real rules are. Talks with lawyers, Frank. I knew you'd like that. Um, thank you for your input, um, Honor and Tim Brady. Uh, just responding to Tim's last point that, you know, as offering counsel to the Niagara Review Committee and providing advice on FACA, I'm happy to participate in your subcommittee to address any legal questions that you have. Uh, um, and we can assess, I don't know, Tim, if there are specific revisions that are based on legal or statutory authority questions, that's my role to help you figure out what we need to do. Um, so uh, uh, to the extent the subcommittee is meeting in the near future, uh, I can be available. And to the and and just to join in with with Brady to the extent that that. Brady needs or I need advice from the or had the help of the Division of General Law, we can contact them. We will contact them. Thank you both. Um, I have one other um, suggestion here um, before we get back to this subcommittee proposal that's before you. And, and that is, um, there is an opportunity to, um, to re-envision how this um, committee does its work outside of these public meetings. As you're all aware, subcommittees are useful in um, both gathering information and developing concrete recommendations for the full committee, such as the report to Congress, where the subcommittee develops the text, it's then brought to the full committee for discussion and adoption. That system works very well and has worked very well for this committee for some time. Um, the alternative would be for 
the only subcommittee to be the subcommittee of the whole and that that committee be convened more regularly with all of the members present um, and tasks assigned to members uh, to develop that that um, those those documents or those recommendations um, that would then be brought back to your full committee meetings in public. So if the objective of a subcommittee is to carry out the work of the review committee and to prepare material for consideration by the full review committee, then one option might be um, for rather than having subcommittees on various issues, having uh, the subcommittee of the whole be the only subcommittee and that tasks are assigned in these public meetings um, to individual members to draft documents or to prepare recommendations that are then brought back in these public meetings. The challenge for us, I will say, uh, and, and this includes me, um, will be ensuring that uh, the subcommittee of the whole is only preparing information for the full committee's consideration. It will be very tempting um, without the, the glaring lights of your computer screen um, to, to have more deliberation than you should have in a closed meeting. Those closed meetings need to only be for administrative purposes, for developing, uh, gathering information um, to that that then comes back to the to the full committee. But it it is a way to get around uh, this issue of who's assigned to which subcommittee. Uh, it's, it proposes additional challenges, I'll say. It, it solves one problem and might uh, create some other hazards. I'm actually okay with that. Um, I think if we can assign duties of who is going to work on the, on the uh, meeting procedures to Frank and Honor and I, and that anyone on the committee that whenever we meet, it is in a de facto subcommittee of the whole, but there may only be three of us there. But any of the other four can participate if they want to. That I think accomplishes the goal. And it would deal, it would allow for new appointees to participate since they are members. And it would allow for people to to uh, work through this. I don't know what a what a subcommittee of a subcommittee is called, but I suspect that there's probably some general law way of dealing with that, some FACA way of dealing with that. Yeah, I, I, this is Frank again. I, I, um, I don't think, I mean, the subcommittee process in part is an efficiency tool. And um, I think it would actually be pretty difficult for uh, all seven members to meet um, as frequently as the subcommittee, uh, you know, would, would meet. And to um, devote the amount of time to all the various topics that, that need to be uh, taken care of. Uh, and also, I think, does run the risk of um, reducing transparency. Because if everybody is meeting as a subcommittee of the whole and they you know, are arguing about a, a particular draft of something, uh, and then they reach some kind of a conclusion that everybody says, "Yeah, okay, we have a consensus. We'll go. We'll go forward." That the, the public doesn't see that, or have the opportunity, have the benefit of participating in that uh, process. So, um, uh, I, I think clearly we need to enable all members of the committee to weigh in on. Uh, all the subject matter that the committee deals with, um, and uh, you know, there's there's mechanisms for for uh, for doing that 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 already exist. I think we've we 
and for several different reasons, political and public health and, and everything else, the, the last four years, especially the last two years, have been kind of hopefully an extraordinary uh, kind of situation and imposed conditions on everybody's behavior that have prevented uh, a lot of the, well, all the meetings practically that we would have liked to have had as, as this carrying out this function. So um, let's let's see what we can do with you know um, reviewing and revising the, the the meeting procedures, and if we can come up with some some text that's satisfactory and that we think functionally will improve the the way we do business, even even when we're constrained in terms of face to face meetings or, or travel budgets or, or things or things of that sort. Okay, so uh, we had we had some uh, difference of opinion there in in terms of of Tim and and Frank's um, discussion. Um, I guess the decision that we have before us is whether or not to um, create a subcommittee on meeting procedures, which would have as its members Frank McManaman, Tim McEwen, and Honor Keeler. That subcommittee would be tasked with uh, making suggested revisions to the meeting procedures um, to bring to the full committee. Are you needing? Excuse me, is the barn bear you need a, needing a motion or a statement of agreement? Uh, um, we're looking for some agreement on that as the, the path forward or the yes. meeting procedures. Okay, then I agree that this uh, subcommittee needs to be formed with the three members mentioned. Thank you. Um, I agree also. I think um, we should move forward uh, with forming this subcommittee and um, developing um, some revised procedures. John? I guess I agree with that proposal. Thank you. Honor? Uh, I agree as well. Okay. All right. Um, Tim and Frank, is that acceptable as a path forward? Uh, okay. And and perhaps those those meeting procedures um, could reflect some of this discussion, as Tim suggested in his initial revisions um, on the makeup of subcommittees um, and. Also, perhaps as we've discussed uh, the the procedure for a subcommittee itself and, and how it might function, I will just remind everyone that uh, while there is um, no public requirement for a subcommittee meeting, uh, the designated federal official must attend a subcommittee meeting. Um, that that is a, a clear requirement and a part of the formalization of this process. So. We will um, proceed with that subcommittee on meeting procedures. Um, did anyone want to add to uh, the the charge or task of that committee of that subcommittee? Uh, this is Frank. I, I hate to actually do this, but. Um, when we talked about this originally, uh, we talked about an expeditious re revision of, of the draft, and it might be that we want to direct the subcommittee to prepare something for discussion at, say, one of the 
late July or August meetings that we have scheduled, which could be uh, one of the new business items there. In order to, you know, move it along. I mean, um, there, there's always some concern there, and I share that. It could be that general a, an addition that, you know, a draft would be presented to the full committee at one of the summer uh, 2021 scheduled meetings. Does everybody agree with adding that general timeline? Um, can we pick a meeting? Let's pick one. I am. Um, just based on the agenda for the meetings, I'd suggest um, not July 7th, um, only because we do have uh, some requests before you that will take up most of that time. Um, uh, it could be the, the July 13th meeting, um, but I believe um, at least one of the members will not be present for that meeting um, or will have some difficulty attending the July 13th meeting. So should we say July 21st? Let's say July 21st or August 10th. I don't know how much rope to give us. Smaller rope, 21st. <laughs> that's, that's fine with me if you want to do it that way. I believe my grandmother had some say, saying about the amount of rope you would give yourself, but we'll leave that <laughs> for another time. There is kind of a traditional saying about that. Okay. I really, um, I, I appreciate everybody's um, nodding of heads um, and uh, ability to be on, on camera. It's, it helps facilitate these kind of discussions where I can see the agreement. Um, Lisa, for the record, um, there is general nodding and agreement on um, that timeline of July 21st for the com for the subcommittee to report back to the full committee. Great. Okay. Um, we are uh, yet again at nearing the top of the hour. Um, would the committee like to continue a discussion of the membership and charge of the subcommittees? So in addition to this new subcommittee on meeting procedures, there is a subcommittee on the report to Congress, a subcommittee on the uh, split collections and a subcommittee on the administration of NAGPRA. Tim? Um, I'll volunteer to be on the report to Congress and the administration one and not on split collections. Thank you. Okay, does anybody oppose to Tim's addition to those two subcommittees? Okay. This is Frank. I, I would like to be on the uh, report to Congress subcommittee um, uh, as well. And I'm interested in the uh, split collections committee, but I would like to sort of hear what the subcommittee has to report on the what's been going on with that, that committee before I actually um, put myself forward for that. Okay. Um, this is not the only opportunity um, if, if we continue this discussion and, and especially if the if the subcommittees would like to provide input back to the full committee. Uh, that is a time Frank where you could you could revise that decision. But for now, uh, does anybody oppose to adding Frank to the report to Congress subcommittee? No. 
Shelby? Shelby, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to volunteer to uh, be on the report to Congress as well, subcommittee as in the split collections uh, subcommittee. Thank you. Any other membership changes to your standing committees? Any other additional subcommittees anyone would like to uh, address or, or any any other subcommittee related reviews before we, we move into more specific discussions? Lisa? Before we move to specific discussions, can, can you read or can I read my uh, list of subcommittee members and subcommittees just to verify that there's agreement on all? Yes, I think that would be a good idea. Thank you. OK, so I have that we. <clears throat> I have that we have the subcommittee of the whole, which of course is unchanged, and then we have four additional committees, including the report to Congress. With members John, Honor, Barnaby, Tim, Frank and Shelby. We have the subcommittee on split collections with members John, Honor, and Shelby. We have the subcommittee on the administration of NAGPRA with members Honor, Barnaby, and Tim. And then we have the newly formed today subcommittee on the meeting procedures with members Tim, Frank, and Honor. Is there a collective nodding of heads that I've captured everybody's wishes? Thank you very much. Um, hi, this is Honor. I just want to make sure um, uh, that Armand has a chance also to be on a subcommittee um, if there are any meetings between now and when he, um, his term end, ends. I know he couldn't be with us today. Um, Melanie, procedurally, would we ask if Armin wanted to join the meeting or so sorry, at the July 7th meeting, would we ask if Armin wanted to join any of these subcommittees? Yeah, I think procedurally. That would be procedurally the way to go. OK. Thank you. I am going to suggest we take another five minute break here at the top of the hour. And when we come back, um, we will start with reports from the subcommittees uh, based on, on the meetings that they've had over the last couple of weeks. Following that, we will be seeking public comment. So if you are interested in making a public comment today, um, I will need you to either raise your hand if, if you're virtual um, or I will open the meeting chat and you'll be able to put in the meeting chat that you would like to make a public comment. At this time, I do have two requests for public comment, just so those folks are aware I did receive their requests and, and those requests are one from Anna Amati at the University of Denver and the second request from Ellen LaFaro with the University of Tennessee Knoxville. So we have two public comments ready. Um, if I'll turn on the chat, if, if others would like to make public comment, you may do so um, when we come back from the break and, and after our last discussion. So five minutes, is that good for everyone? All right.
Okay, welcome back everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, at this time, we have an opportunity on the agenda for uh, reports by the subcommittees. Um, uh, the subcommittees uh, can use this opportunity to bring information back to the full committee for discussion. Uh, if any of the subcommittees would like further clarification on their charge or tasks, this is an opportunity to discuss that as a committee of the whole. Um, as a reminder, uh, there, there were uh, three subcommittees um, that had met over the last few weeks. Um, the subcommittee on the report to Congress, the subcommittee on split collections, and the subcommittee on the administration of NAGPRA. For everyone's clarification, and especially for purposes of the public record, I'd like to take this opportunity to just remind the, the committee, as well as members of the public, um, what the charges of each of those subcommittees are. The subcommittee on the report to Congress is uh, fairly self-evident. Um, the the task for the review committee on the report to con or on the subcommittee on the report to Congress uh, is to um, prepare a draft of the report to Congress uh, for consideration by the full committee. The subcommittee on split collections. Um, sorry, I was trying to find my notes here. The subcommittee on split collections uh, was formed in the October 2018 meeting with the purpose to study NAGPRA compliance issues concerning collections from the same site that are split among different museums or federal agencies and to develop recommendations for the full committee's consideration. Uh, this subcommittee will also address federal agency collections in non-federal repositories. The Subcommittee on the Administration of NAGPRA was also formed in October of 2018, and it was tasked with uh, considering the administration of NAGPRA through the National NAGPRA program, including funding, grants, and staff capacities. Um, that is a basic overview of the committees. Would any of the subcommittees like to begin a discussion uh, for the purposes of, of order, I'll say let's start with the report to Congress subcommittee. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, Melanie and everyone. Um, I'm just, uh, I know that we have reports that we're, we are reporting out at a later date. So um, I, are you seeking sort of a summary or um, just some things that we can dispense with at this point? And um, with regard to the report to Congress, um, there is a report to Congress that was already decided upon by the review committee um, for the 2019 report to go forward. Um, I think that's something that we can discuss at this point. Um, and I'd also like to make a motion that our committee um, requests the National Park Service to distribute um, the committee's uh, fiscal year 2019 report um, and that a distribution letter be administered uh, to acknowledge and apologize for our lateness with this report and the delay in transmitting it um, and to have it distributed to um, the House Speaker, the Majority Leader, um, and the Minority Leader, and to all the members of the Natural Resources Committee 
and Senate President uh, Pro Temp, uh, Majority Leader, Minority Leader, and all members of the Committee on Indian Affairs, and that the DFO inform the committee um, each week on the status of this so that it gets out as soon as possible. Um, the review committee has already um, wanted that distribution uh, and report to go out. So I don't think we have to delay any further with that. Thanks. Lisa, did you capture um, the instructions for distribution of the report? That's a little bit different than what we've done in the past. It will be in on the recording. I will be able to pull it from there, but no, I wasn't able to uh, type it quite that quickly. Um, but I did get the 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 gist of it, and I know where it is in the recording. Okay, thank you. Okay, so so again, honor what what you're um, asking of the committee is a discussion both on um, to send the report the 2019 report to Congress and then some additional um, distributions of that report. We had previously only sent the report to the relevant committees um, rather than um, some of the additional um, members of Congress that you mentioned. Um, yeah, and the subcommittee um, had also agreed to that this was a good recommendation and um, that was a motion. So. If there's a second, that would be good, and then we can open up for discussion. I'll second. Okay, is there a discussion on the 2019 report to Congress? Shelby, um, is this um, is this 2019 report the one that is on the website? Uh, no, this is the report that was approved by the committee um, in October of Is there any other discussion on the 2019 report? Would you like to proceed with a vote? John or Frank, uh, any, any discussion or? No, we're just the motion. The motion on the floor is just to move the uh, the 2019 report forward. Correct. That's what we're with the addition. Yeah, yeah the uh, the motion was um, uh, to instruct the Park Service to send the 2019 report to Congress to include additional um, people on that on the distribution list for that report. Um, and, and that includes the leadership of Congress. Um, and then the final suggestion was to provide uh, for the DFO to provide weekly updates to the committee on the status of that report. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Are we ready to vote or any discussion? Yeah. Okay, I will I will call a vote again. Um honor. Yes. Tim. Yes. Frank? Yes. Barnaby? Yes. 
John? Yes. Shelby? Yes. Thank you. The National Park Service will proceed um, with sending the 2019 report to Congress. We will um, include additional uh, members of Congress on that distribution, and I will provide you regular weekly updates on the status of that report. Would the subcommittee like to continue a discussion of additional reports to Congress? Melanie, um, we, we do have another time, don't we, for um, talking in detail about the reports to Congress uh, in July? Yes, um, there is time on um, the July 21st agenda for subcommittee discussion, uh, but we can also fit that in um, probably on the 13th as well. I think I'd like to just propose that we have a more in-depth discussion about the reports to Congress at that time. Certainly, um, we will add subcommittee uh, discussions to the agenda for both the 13th and the 21st. So there's uh, time if, if necessary, um, or if you're ready, either of those days. Um, could we keep it to the 21st? I'm just concerned about, um, um, any kind of notice requirements. So I want to make sure that we're we're in line with those, if there are any. Um, we uh, we're fully noticed um, for these meetings for for all of the meetings this summer, and we've included a a broad scope agenda. Um, so we can add um, pieces to uh, these agendas as necessary. I will um, tell the full committee, um, as I mentioned to the subcommittee on the report to Congress, um, that there is, uh, it is possible for the committee to develop a draft of a report to Congress and approve it um, over this series of meetings um, with the, the last meeting on August 19th, if there was a, a report that the committee was satisfied with and it approved it, um, we could proceed then um, at the August 19th meeting with the final approval of a report and proceed then with submitting that to Congress. Although the report covers a fiscal year, meaning through the end of September, um, if there are no meetings scheduled um, between August 19th and September 30th, uh, there's no reason why the committee couldn't finish its report um, prior to the end of the fiscal year. Um, certainly we could include fiscal year statistics with that report um, from the program. Um, I can append those uh, with your um, with your discussion and approval of that. Um, but if there is other information that you would want to include um, that you don't have access to before August 19th, then we would need to convene probably another meeting either in September um, or October to approve that final report. I just wanted to be clear that you do have an opportunity here to finish the report over this series of meetings. Um, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be done unless you feel like there's information you wouldn't have by August 19th that you would need to include in that report. Honor. Hi, uh, Melanie. I I had requested some information, and I'll just read that out here. And I know you've provided some of it at this point already, but I just want to make sure um, you know that it's on the record and that that other folks on the committee are aware of that um, and the public. So I had requested. Um, 
you know, that the dates of all committee and subcommittee public and non-public meetings from October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020 um, come forward to the subcommittee and the broader committee. Um, as far as notices go, the number of notices published between October 1st, 2019 and September 30th um, for each notice, the number of days uh, elapsed when the notice was received and when it appeared in the Federal Register. Um, and sorry, that date was October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020. Um, I, another item was the number of unpublished notice, notices on hand on October 1st, 2019 and on September 30th, 2020. Um, with regard to extensions, the details of any extensions to the inventory deadline that were approved between October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020. Um, with regard to grants, a list of all grants, uh, grant requests received in fiscal year 2020, including the name of the requesting tribe or museum, proposal title, the amount requested, the score given by the grants panel, and if applicable, the amount awarded. Um, with regard to civil penalties, the number of allegations of failure to comply received from October 1st, 2019 and September 30th, 2020. Um, again, with civil penalties, the number of determinations of failure to comply and of penalty assessments issued from October 1st, 2019 and September 30th, 2020. And also with civil penalties, the number of allegations that had not been adjudicated on October 1st, 2019 and on September 30th, 2020. With regard to assuming responsibility for inadvertent discoveries, details of any cases in which the department assumed responsibility for an inadvertent discovery uh, for any, another department from October 1st, 2019 and September 30th, 2020, and the program budget breakdown for fiscal year 2020. Thank you. Frank? Um, <clears throat> We talked about the uh, 2019 uh, report. Could the um, the current well, could the the uh, subcommittee members who would have worked on it give a, give a little uh, summary of where we are with the 2020 report to Congress? Because you just mentioned the 2021 report, which we could try to get together um, by uh, uh, to review or approve. Uh, at the August 19th meeting, um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm just not recalling where we are with the 2020 report. Um, hi, Frank. So um, there have been some discussion in the subcommittee uh, meeting on the report to Congress, and we have other committee members here too. Um, about um, the discussion about whether to combine the 2020 report with the 2021 report or to keep them separate, and there were differing opinions. Um, and that's something I think we'll probably be discussing in further detail. Um, but as far as the report goes, um, I believe those are being uh, created separately so that the full committee can make a decision on that. So, so it sounds like regarding subcommittee work, in addition to the new subcommittee on the uh, meeting procedures, the, uh, the annual report subcommittee needs to get together this summer also and move, move forward with, what, with, the, uh, with the drafts, either a single draft or a draft of uh, uh, two different reports for the different years. That's correct. And I think some of this information will be helpful to us moving forward. Okay. Thank you. And just one thought. Um, I think the idea that Melanie suggested of trying to get a report to Congress out 
by the last meeting that we have in August is a good one. And I wholly support that. Uh, I am a little nervous about providing Congress with a report on a fiscal year that is not yet completed. Uh, and I think my preference, if we can get something done by August, we should stick with 2020. If we can't get something done by August, then perhaps we can consider combining them. But sending something to the Congress about a fiscal year that's not yet completed makes me a little nervous. I will just note that um, it, again, please uh, remember it, it takes quite some time um, once the committee completes its reports um, for it to be um, sent to Congress. Um, there is a process within the department where uh, letters have to be prepared um, to send with that report to Congress. And um, that has in the past been a very long process. Um, Melanie, could you give us some idea of what that process has been um, and how long it's taken? Because that might be something that um, would be worthwhile to include in our report to Congress. Um, yes, you can um, you can see the the difference in um, uh, in this based on the uh, cover letters, the, the date of the cover letter for the report to Congress. That's something that I had shared with the subcommittee and I would be happy to share with the, the rest of you. And, and we will be updating the copies of the reports that are on our website to ensure that they all have those cover letters. So it is publicly available what, what date they were sent to Congress. In general, um, it takes, um, three to six months sometimes. Uh, it's in other cases been quite a bit longer depending on what happens um, within the federal government. Um, it, uh, it can take quite some time um, before that report makes its way through the department and is sent then on to Congress. Melanie, I, um, I suspect Frank and I will be the only ones that find this entertaining, but would it be possible for you to send us the surname copy of the cover letter that accompanied the, what's the last one, FY 2018? To see uh, I don't I don't know if I can send you that or not, I can ask. Yeah, because either, either if it's a surname copy or if it's in the electronic system, it would be good to know who signed off on it and when. And that would give us a good firm idea of what the process is. And if there's some obstacle, personally, having worked in that office for a long time, six to eight months to get that report out when it's not the Park Services or the Department of the Interior's report, it's our report, six or eight months to get that out seems crazy. So if there's some obstacle that we can identify to try to expedite that process, I think it would be useful, and I think the surname would help us. Is that fair, Frank, based on <laughs> previous experience? Um, it it definitely have, plays into uh, into the, the potential for delays. I suspect, though, many of those surname, the names that are actually surnamed will have changed, so it's really the key, to, the key is which office is it going to? That's the, the main thing. And that I'm sure that's what you meant by the surname copy. Who has to, who has to sign off on that? Agreed. But I think the surname copy will tell us exactly the date they did it and who it was and what they were representing. That's true. Sorry, Melanie, I know at one point, I think you had mentioned um, it being a delay of, was it three to six months or six to nine months? Typically takes three to six months. Okay, that's, that's quite a long time. 
I mean, particularly since it's not a Park Service product, it's not an interior product, it's the review committee's report. It's our report. As directed by Congress. Is there other discussion of the report to Congress? Okay, I will be sure that that all of the new members of this subcommittee receive the correspondence that we've had over the last um, month um, on this subcommittee and I will contact you about convening another subcommittee meeting. Um, to discuss the reports to Congress so that you can continue to discuss the um, what what you will distribute to Congress um, at your next uh, public meetings. Thank you, that'd be great. Sure. Um, the other two subcommittees on split collections or on administration of NAGPRA. Um, would any of the committee members like to speak or discuss any, any issues related to those subcommittees? Melanie, I think um, we might be able to have a broader discussion um, on later in July on this when we make our report. Okay. Okay, a any other um, subcommittee discussion? I have um, opened access to the chat. If anybody would like to make a public comment, you're welcome to put your name uh, in the meeting chat or you can raise your hand um, using the, the raise your hand um, comment if, if it's available to you. Um, if you don't have access in either of those ways, if, if you're calling by phone, um, we can work out another system. Um, you can certainly email me at, at nagpra underscore info at nps.gov and we can arrange a time for public comment. I'll also take this opportunity to say that the review committee is seeking presentations for later in the summer. If there are any um, museums, federal agencies or tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations who wish to make a presentation to the review committee. Um, the review committee is always interested in hearing from those who implement NAGPRA on the barriers um, and successes in doing so. Uh, as I mentioned before, we did have two people reach out um, interested in making public comment. The first of those is Anne Amati with the University of Denver. And if you will just give me one minute to allow her access to video. Oh, it looks like Anne is no longer on uh, with us by... Melanie, yeah. I'm on. Melanie, I'm on the phone. Thanks, Anne. I, I knew you'd figure it out. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anne. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I am Anna Amati, and I'm the NAGPRA coordinator at the University of Denver Museum of Anthropology. 
I want to provide an update on our initiative to create a NAGPRA community of practice to support practitioners and advance implementation. The NAGPRA community of practice is created of, by, and for the NAGPRA community. A few years ago, I recognized the need to increase capacity for NAGPRA implementation in museums, improve overall engagement of the museum field with ongoing NAGPRA work, and decrease misunderstanding and confusion still associated with NAGPRA among some museum professionals. To address this need and with the support of mentors and colleagues, I developed a three-year project and received a national leadership grant for museums from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We are now nearing the end of the third year and the grant period has been extended to September of 2022. Although the project started with a focus on museum professionals, the NAGPRA community of practice has been broadened to be for everyone engaged in or interested in NAGPRA implementation. Since my last update to this committee, we have made lots of progress with the NAGPRA community of practice. In January 2020, we started hosting monthly video calls. We quickly expanded to a bi-monthly schedule, alternating between scheduled presentations and open discussions. All the calls are recorded and made available on the project's Google Share Drive. We have 40 to 80 participants per session. And recently we have had presentations on the University of California, determining cultural affiliation and taking care of ourselves as NAGPRA practitioners. The video calls take place on the second and fourth Friday of the month at 11 a.m. Mountain Time and you can find access information on the project's website. In October 2020, we co-hosted the sixth annual repatriation conference with the Association on American Indian Affairs. The conference was all virtual with over 700 registered attendees. The post-conference survey revealed that the conference was particularly successful in exposing attendees to new ideas. Most important to the NAGPRA community of practice, the conference was also successful in helping attendees expand their professional network and in creating a sense of community. In January of 2021, we formed a 10-person steering committee to ensure the sustainability of the NAGPRA community of practice after the end of the grant period and brought in planning responsibilities beyond myself. In addition to ongoing planning for the video call presentations, the steering committee drafted a mission statement and vision statement to help guide activities and goals. At the same time, other groups have been formed. There is the Southeastern NAGPRA Community of Practice, which provides a Southeastern focused support system enabling individuals who are involved in NAGPRA to more easily find ways to talk and share resources specific to the Southeast. Another group is the Indigenous Collections Care Working Group. They are working to create a guide that will offer scalable considerations and templates for implementation advocacy and creation of policies and procedures that prioritize indigenous knowledge. I have also started a Colorado NAGPRA practitioners group to discuss NAGPRA issues in Colorado. The project hosts a listserv, a Facebook group, and a LinkedIn group. We also maintain a Google share drive where the community can share templates, documents, and other resources. We are collecting contact information to create a NAGPRA community directory. The directory is shared on the Google Drive and also shared with the National NAGPRA program and is updated regularly. Of course, COVID has hampered some of the project initiatives. I had hoped to present at more museum conferences on NAGPRA. We were able to present at three national, two regional, and one local conference before COVID shut things down. I created a two-page NAGPRA guide for museum collections that was supposed to be distributed at conferences. Instead, I have made it available on the Google Drive. We do still have funding available to support NAGPRA presentations at museum conferences. So if anyone listening is interested, please get in touch with me. Thank you for this opportunity to give you an, an update on the NAGPRA community of practice, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Ann. Are there any questions from the committee for Anne? Tim? 
Um, I just want to say that Anne's done a very good job with the community practice. It's a really useful resource um, and has been great. Um, I, I've, been, I've been attending them for quite some time. Uh, I generally don't say anything, but it's always good to hear what everybody else is doing. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Anne. Our next public comment um, is from Ellen LaFaro and Raylan Butler. I'm going to attempt to allow them access to video and audio. Ellen, you should be able to turn on your audio and video. And Ray Lynn, you should be able to turn on your audio and video. We can't hear you, Ellen. You can try control shift M. Let me um, let me try one other thing. Hang on. Okay, see now, Ellen, if you can, if you have an opportunity to unmute. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me this time. <laughs> Third time's the charm. Thank you. Um, I'm Ellen LaFaro. Um, I'm the Director of Repatriation for the University of Tennessee. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience being part of the NAGPRA community of practice for these past few years. Um, and I now serve on its steering committee. Uh, the bi-monthly Zoom calls are particularly um, informative and connecting um, as I work in relative isolation at my university. And I know a number of other folks who do the same. Um, I'm also working with three other women, Raylan Butler of the Muscogee Nation, Amanda Thompson of the University of Georgia, and Megan Buchanan of Auburn University. And together we created the Southeastern NAGPRA Community of Practice to provide a Southeastern focused support system. I'd like to turn the floor over now to Raylan Butler, who is the manager of the Historic and Cultural Preservation Department for the Muscogee Nation to give you a few more details about the Southeastern focused NAGPRA community. Thanks for your time. Hi, can you hear me okay? Uh, Raylan Butler, Jaho Jifkidos, Amalegida Wakogi, Almadowa Pakan Tallahassee. Uh, my name is Raylan Butler. I'm the manager of the Historic and Cultural Preservation Department at the Muscogee Nation. Um, thank you to the committee and committee members for giving us opportunity to say a few words. Um, just wanted to follow up on the Southeastern NAGPRA community of practice. Um, is an offshoot of the national community. And we have been having monthly Zoom calls. Uh, today, we had our sixth meeting of the year, and we on average have about 60 to 70 participants on the call. And um, we have over 290 practitioners on our email listserv um, that are in the Southeast or that have collections, NAGPRA collections from the Southeast. And um, Actually, in today's meeting, we had representatives from the Seminole Tribe of Florida, 
um, talk a little bit about their Tribal Historic Preservation Office uh, for the Seminole Tribe. And we also had an open discussion where practitioners can submit questions and seek advice from um, the, the community and offer solutions if, the, if there are any are known. Um, we talked a lot about um, consultation and uh, previous meetings have been representatives from tribes presenting on you know who are who's the best point of contact for NAGPRA and how um, their offices are set up contact information and we um, also had consultation um, from museum perspectives in in some of our sessions as well um, but we are basically wanting to offer um, connection and um, bringing our communities together you know, as the data shows, there are many institutions in the Southeast or tend to be uh, more ancestors still in, in curation. And um, we were trying very hard to, to make all re resources available to help um, improve NAGPRA implementation in the Southeast region. Thank you. Thank you, Raylan and Ellen. Tim, did you I have also a want to thank Ellen and Raylan for the great work that they are doing down in the southeast. Those are very good meetings. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. Um, it was good to hear them, and I look forward to hearing more. Hi, this is John. I just wanted to thank uh, our presenters for their their updates and presentations on the on the, the, those programs and projects, they certainly sound certainly sound great. I'm certainly pretty. This is the type of information that uh, I think the review committee needs to hear or the updates like this during its meetings. Oftentimes there can be or sometimes we can there can be lots of uh, I don't know negative kind of embedded in some of the in some of this, and it's good for us to hear the uh, good to hear the the positive updates along with along with any of the the barriers that are encountered or how those barriers are being overcome in the day to day uh, in the day to day work of, of tribes and museums and, and universities. Any other questions or comments? OK, um, I think this is a very good opportunity to remind everyone uh, present um, that the review committee is very interested in hearing um, from those of you who do NAGPRA day in and day out on your experiences, your successes, uh, your struggles. Um, those inform the review committee and their work. Um, we would encourage anyone who is interested in making public comment to please come forward uh, now or at another meeting. Um, if you would prefer to make a more formal presentation, we do have time allotted for those as well during the meetings upcoming. Um, you're welcome to make that presentation by, by video and audio, or if you can just call in, um, that's acceptable as well. We will work with you to facilitate that presentation or comment uh, if you have any trouble accessing the meeting. John. Yes, just to follow up on your on your comments, uh, Melanie, uh, uh, I think it's it's really important. And it does it does inform the, the, the content and recommendations of the report uh, from the review committee to Congress. I think it adds to a much richer report we're actually hearing from the people uh, that they're doing it on the they're doing it every day, uh, and I I think it's uh, I, mean, I mean I think those are I think those are important. So it's actually our recommendations or the recommendations the report are based on what we're what we're hearing, uh, and not you know just solely based on the discussions we may have in the subcommittee meetings. But the recommendations do have I mean th there is some weight behind those recommendations rather than it's it's. At least a big portion of it is coming from the 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 overall community and not just from the the, re, the review committee itself. So, I I appreciate those, and I certainly am a big proponent of of anyone who wants to uh, share their their comments and, and their experiences in the day to day. Thank you.
Well, we have come to the end of our time together. Um, is is there any other comment or discussion that the committee uh, would like to have? Any any other specific topics, perhaps, that the committee would like to ask for presentations on or public comment? Honor. Melanie, I was just wondering if you could give uh, a, an overview of the number of attendees since um, I don't think we can see, oh, maybe we can see them all, but um, how many people are actually attending and is this better attendance than normal or in person? Um, uh, so we have had, um, I think we started with around 70 or so. It, it grew a little bit over our time, maybe close to, to 85. It's dropped off a little bit as we've neared the end of our time, um, but it's uh, pretty consistently between um, between 50 and, and 70 people in attendance. Um, I, I would say that's a pretty good number um, for uh, a committee meeting. Um, I am looking at Lisa, but she can't see me looking at her. <laughs> um, I know we certainly, depending on the location, have had more at some meetings, uh, but we've had a lot fewer as well. Lisa, what's your impression of that number? I am excited by the number of people who attended today. I think that this is just, uh, since it is the first of the series of meetings, I'm hopeful that we will see attendance uh, stay consistent or perhaps even improve throughout the summer. Melanie, this is Stephen. In my experience, this is certainly more than we usually get at a telephonic meeting of the committee. Um, and I agree with with Lisa. It's uh, and and with you that it's it's more than some and and less than others, depending. Yes, on the location generally. Thank you for that question, Honor. And it reminds me that I wanted to uh, make a pledge to anybody who's been joining us for the first time uh, that not all meetings are so procedural heavy, uh, that, that we do have um, some more interesting content uh, as, as we go on. And, and certainly our next meeting on July 7th, uh, where there will be three requests to the review committee for dispositions of Native American human remains um, will be uh, of, of interest, and I hope that people will join us for the rest of our discussions um, over the summer. The full schedule is available on the NPS website. Again, that's nps.gov slash NAGPRA. Um, and at the bottom of the page, you can find events and all of the meetings are listed there, as will the uh, access to the meetings um, be available there just before the meeting days. So the next meeting is July 7th, again at 3 p.m. Eastern time uh, via um, this same platform, um, or you can call in by phone. Any final words from members of the committee? Uh, I, I have just one uh, uh, comment and really a question, but um, as the DFO, uh, Melanie, you'll be sending out uh, information for the subcommittee meetings. We talked about at least two of them uh, needing to meet in the near in the near term to report. And so, just wanted to con we're going to get something from you on along that line, right? That's correct. I will coordinate that. Okay. Thank you very much. Last chance to be on the record. Anyone? Uh, hi, Melanie. This is this is John. Uh, as always, want to uh, thank you and the and Lisa and the rest of the staff at the uh, at the NACPA program for all the hard work that you that you do. It's certainly appreciated. Here, 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 here. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else, we will adjourn the meeting. Thanks, Melanie. Good to see everybody. 
See you in July. Have a happy fourth. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. Great to see everyone. See you in about a week. All right. Thank you.